Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Changing our outlook by an uplook is a choice. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be in the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut from the fold and there be no herds in the stalls. When things aren't going well, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing, but with the troubles and stresses of life in a fallen world, how do we actually put this scripture into practice? Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy brings us to Philippians to teach us the biblical cure to anxiety. It's the second of a three-part message titled, Don't Be Scared, from the Off Color series. If you missed any of the study thus far, you can catch up online at ktt.org. Let's prepare our hearts now and listen. Here's Pastor Philip. Having defined the meaning and described the sources and detailed the effects, let's discover the remedy. All right, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. This is a God-given prescription for worry. It's a passage that has a prohibition to it. Be anxious for nothing. It has a prescription to it. Well, rejoice, be gentle, anticipate the Lord's coming, pray, give thanks, and focus on the right things. And it has a promise attached to it. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. In fact, this section, I believe, is one, a revisiting of earlier themes like unity, joy, prayer. It's an outworking of our salvation in terms of sanctification, which Paul talks about in chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, and it's a God-given prescription for peace. Who would like to enjoy some peace today? Well, you and me and every human heart, and it's promised here the peace of God will surpass all understanding, and it will guard your heart. In fact, that Greek word is more than guard. It's a military term that means garrison. When I was growing up as a young man in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, you know about the insurgency of the IRA that tried to sever Northern Ireland from the United Kingdom against the will of a majority of its people. It wasn't unusual for me or anyone walking the streets of Belfast to just bump into a fully dressed British soldier in body armor and carrying a rifle just became an everyday thing because soldiers were garrisoned in Belfast, guard our city and our people against the IRA. And Paul is saying, you know what? God wants to guard your heart. He wants to send His peace to guard the walls of your heart and your life. Isn't that a beautiful picture? To live a guarded life the very peace that is found on the halls of heaven can be ours today. So let's look at this text and remind ourselves, by the way, the man that wrote it lived it. The man that wrote it lived it. Okay, this isn't something written by a first-year student at the Master's Seminary, a theological paper from a guy who doesn't know what ends up. This is written by a battle-tested servant of Jesus Christ, He's going to tell us to rejoice, verse 4. He's going to tell us to rest, verse 5. He's going to tell us to recognize that Jesus is coming, verse 5. He's going to tell us to turn our problems into prayers and requests, verse 6. He's going to tell us to recount God's blessing in our lives through thanksgiving, verse 6. He's going to tell us to reflect on things that enlarge our faith, verses 8 and 9. And he's going to tell us to respond by doing what he does. But let's just cover two of those this morning. Rejoice and rest. Rejoice, verse 4. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The first run on the ladder out of the pit of anxiety is to renew our joy in God. The theme of joy is threaded throughout this letter. It tolls like a bell. In chapter 4, verse 1, he calls his converts his joy. In chapter 1, verse 4, he prays for them with joy. In verses 10 and 17 of chapter 4, he rejoices in their generosity through Epaphroditus. In chapter 2, verse 2, he asks them to unite to make his joy. In chapter 1, he rejoices that Christ is preached even by those who do it with wrong motives. Joy is a bell that tolls throughout this chapter. And he calls them to renew their joy, to rejoice, to re-up on their joy. No matter the context, no matter the circumstance, he's looking for an intentional act. This is an imperative, by the way. He's commanding them to be joyful because you and I can choose to be joyful. Rejoice is a choice. And Paul calls us to make that choice, to make an intentional act of refocusing our soul and refreshing our soul in God. His love, mercy, justice, faithfulness, sovereignty, sufficiency. You see, joy is a shift not of circumstance, but perspective. Rejoice, re-up on your joy by focusing in the Lord, who He is, what He has done. You see, anxiety is a joy killer. It feeds on and exaggerates actual problems or potential problems with a focus on negative outcomes. It creates inner agitation. It robs us of calm and an ability to be gentle. And Paul says, no, you need to rejoice in the Lord. In his book, Anxious for Nothing, Max Licato gives a little acrostic for calm, which I think is very helpful. C, celebrate God's goodness, rejoice in the Lord. A, ask for God's help by making your quest made known to Him. L, leave your concerns with Him, with thanksgiving and a reflection on His faithfulness in the past. M, meditate on good things by thinking upon things which are of a good report. That's good. Where we're at in verse 4 is C, celebrate God's goodness in Christ. Rejoice in the Lord. Not in your health, Not in your husband's love, present or absent. Not in your child's obedience. Not in your financial situation. There'll be times when we can rejoice in those things. When the sun's to our face and the wind's to our back. But since that changes, we're better focusing and always better focusing in the Lord who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His mercy endures forever. The Word is settled in heaven. His grace is sufficient. His peace passes human comprehension. Joy is the fruit of celebrating God's goodness in Christ, where you intentionally push back against negative thoughts, dark moods, and crushing circumstances by focusing on what you know to be true of God, the gospel, and Jesus Christ. That's where our focus needs to be. That's where our joy needs to be. Listen to Psalm 35, verses 9 and 10. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice In his salvation, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him? Yes, the poor and needy from him who plunders him. A lot of anxiety, anxious situations there, but we can find our joy in the Lord. What about Psalm 104, verses 33 to 34, where you have this similar rejoicing in the Lord? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to Him. I will be glad in the Lord. I love the way the New Living Translation puts that. May He be pleased about all my thoughts about Him. 
You're going to rejoice in Him. When we think hard about God, not ourselves, not our enemies, not our circumstances, joy bubbles. Joy bubbles come to the surface of our soul. We have reason to rejoice. We have reason to say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because I enjoy God's crazy love. I can experience God's promised presence. I can know God's sufficient grace, and I can live God's perfect peace. Changing our outlook by an uplook is a choice. Let me say that again. Changing our outlook by an uplook is a choice. And we've got to focus our hearts there. Isn't that the choice that Habakkuk made? Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be in the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut from the fold and there be no herds in the stalls. Basically, when things aren't going well, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like a deer's feet. He will make me walk on the high hills. That's beautiful. Joy is never out of our reach, for the Lord is always at our hand. In fact, Paul lived that didn't he? I don't have time to develop this, but if you go to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18, let me paint in the background. For two years in Judah, Paul had been kicked about like a political football. Then he appeals on the basis of his Roman citizenship, so he gets out of that difficult situation. But on his way to Rome, what happens? He gets shipwrecked and nearly drowns in the Mediterranean Sea. He survives that, and he gets to Rome. And while he's in Rome, not sure if Caesar is going to give him thumbs up or thumbs down, he learns about the fact that some are actually preaching Christ out of envy and jealousy, using his circumstances to their own advantage. That's discouraging. But he says this, but I want you to know, brothers, this has all happened and turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. People are getting saved in Caesar's house. And I know about these brothers who are preaching Christ out of envy, but look at verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. And I will rejoice. That's focused thinking, my friend. That's discipline, where he fights moods, thoughts, negativity, and rejoices in the Lord. Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Graham Lutz, whose writings are very helpful. In her book on Genesis, God's story, tells about the afternoon she had just taken her kids out to lunch. It was the last day of school. The summer was coming. Everybody was in a good mood. And they'd gone out to lunch. They got home middle of the afternoon to find the door open. They get into the house and they realized it had been rifled. The grandmother's clock was gone. The jewelry was gone. Anything of any importance in the home was gone. The police arrived, dusted the place down for fingerprints, said, look, you know what? This was done by professionals. I know this is cold comfort, but no matter what you'd have done, they would have done this at some point. Eventually, she puts the kids to bed, puts herself to bed. She's lying on pillows, missing their pillowcases because the thieves had used the pillowcases to put all the good stuff in them. She's lying there feeling very insecure. And she begins to wonder, you know what? What do I have in life that can't be taken from me? She gets pretty negative. My health could be robbed by illness. My education could be outdated by advanced knowledge. My house could be burned to the ground. My children could leave home. My husband could drop dead tomorrow. My youth can be robbed by old age. My reputation by gossip. She's getting pretty distracted at this point. Until, which is often the case, if you've hidden God's Word in your heart, it'll come back to you. She's lying, and the Holy Spirit reminds her of something she had learned from Scripture. Hold on a minute. Doesn't Peter say that we have an inheritance that can never perish? And Jesus said we have treasure that can never be stolen. And then she begins to think about the things that she has not lost and she can never lose. And then she begins to rejoice in the Lord. And by the morning, this wonderful woman of God, who's a good teacher, alphabetizes 
all the things that she has in Jesus Christ. A, accepted by God. B, beloved by God. C, chosen by God. D, delivered by God. E, enlightened by God. F, forgiven by God. I have G, the grace of God. H, hope for the future. I, inheritance in heaven. J, justification. K, knowledge of God. L, love. M, mercy. N, nearness to God. O, oneness with God. P, peace. Q, quickening of the Spirit. And she goes the whole way down the alphabet. She chooses to rejoice in the Lord. And it brings a peace. Okay, for a few minutes, time's gone. Rest. Won't be as long. Verse 5. Famous last words. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Don't worry. Don't worry. Even though you have every right to worry, knowing my history. (laughs) Verse 5. Here's what we've got. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Now, this has been variously translated gentleness, sweet reasonableness, forbearance, yieldedness. In fact, it speaks of not insisting on one's rights. That's the idea of gentleness, this kind of sweet reasonableness, this forbearance, this this putting up with stuff and putting up with people. Patience, right? Joy is a fruit of the Spirit and so is patience. By implication, it speaks of actually trusting God to bring justice and vindication. It's what Jesus did, right? 1 Peter 2.23, when he was reviled, he didn't revile, didn't fight back, and he committed himself to the Creator who does righteously. It's Paul, 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith has done me great harm, the Lord repay him. I'm not going to go after him. I'm just going to Leave that with the Lord. I'm going to trust God to vindicate me. In fact, the linguistic key to the Greek New Testament, a little resource John MacArthur put me onto years ago, it's fantastic, says this of that word. The word signifies a humble, patient, steadfastness, which enables us to submit to injustice and disgrace and maltreatment without hatred, trusting in God in spite of it all. It's a resting in the sovereignty of God. That's my closing thought. That's how peace comes. That's how we battle worry. We rest in the sovereignty of God. We're being called here to be still and steadfast, knowing that God has us in the palm of His hand. You can look it up in your own time. Isaiah 49, verse 16. Our names are written in the palm of His hand. It's where we live, in the palm of God's hand. Isaiah 41, verse 10, reinforces that. We're in the palm of God's hand and God's got everything in hand because He's sovereign. Leave room for His wrath. God will work all things together for good. Stop the worrying. Stop trying to take control. John Kwasney, in his book, Pursuing a Heart of Wisdom, says this, Worry is the heart's attempt to control what cannot be controlled. That's true, isn't it? Anxiety of the heart this deep and persistent is fueled by a desperate longing to be God rather than letting God be God. I think that's a true statement. See, instead of resting, instead of giving that situation up to God, instead of realizing that God will vindicate us and bring justice, if not now, later, that everything is in His hand and under His control. We don't like where God puts us. We start to worry about it and we start to try and take charge of it. We want to be God. We don't want God choosing what we go through and what time we get out of it and how we get out of it. That's at the heart of worry. And that's why, as Max Licato says as we close, that the antidote to worry is to stabilize your soul with the sovereignty of God. He also says, God's answer for troubled times has always been the same. Heaven has an occupied throne. It's a beautiful statement. I want to read it again. God's answer for troubled times has always been the same. Heaven has an occupied throne. And that's why you can give up your rights to the sovereignty and providence of God. Trust Him to bring justice in His time. Trust Him to work all things together for good and show that to all men. Show them a peace that passes all human prescription and description. As you settle and stabilize your soul in the sovereignty of God, the throne of God is occupied. 
Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, hold the presses. This man, not perfect, had ruled Judah for 50 years and brought prosperity and peace. Now he was dead. There's a political vacuum. He had political rivals. Were the enemies of Israel about the pounce? Was the economy about the tank? But in the year that King Uzziah died, what did we read? I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. That's the antidote for worry, an occupied throne. Revelation 4, verse 1. As futurists and premillennialists here at Kindred, we believe that what you read from chapter 4 to 19 puts you in the great tribulation, the millennial kingdom, and the eternal state. It is not a fulfillment of AD 70 or a description of the ransacking of the city of Jerusalem. It's future. And we are taken into the future when everything will begin to collapse. Antichrist will be present. The world will be at war. God will be pouring out his wrath. But I want you to understand how that all begins. John's about to see some staggering things. And he says in Revelation 4, when I was called up hither, and I saw a throne and him who sat on it, which was the description of the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. I saw a throne. That's the remedy for anxiety. An occupied throne. Stop trying to be God. Rest in his providence. He will justify his people, vindicate his church. He will punish the wicked. He will right wrongs. He will work all things together for good. Chill out. Follow the example of Martin Luther, who in a conversation with Philip Melanchthon, a fellow reformer, Melanchthon said to Luther, what will we decide to talk about today, Martin? What will be our agenda today? Melanchthon said, why not discuss the governance of the universe? To which Martin Luther replied, this day you and I will go fishing and leave the governance of the universe to God. Why don't you go fishing? and leave the governance of the universe to God. Why don't you go a walk with your children and remind yourself of the simple blessings of life and that God's got everything in hand? Why don't you go to sleep tonight? Leave the governance of the universe to God. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, the second of a three-part message called Don't Be Scared. If you missed the first part, feel free to catch up online at ktt.org. Or for easy listening on the go, download the KTT app or podcast. Just search your favorite app store or podcast platform for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Pastor Philip? Hey, I just want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for being a part of the Know the Truth family. Some of you may have been following our ministry for quite some time. And while you're familiar with me and what we do here, I'd love the opportunity to get to know you better. Whether you're a long-term listener who's never reached out to us before, or someone who used to be connected to us but has since lost touch, or even if you're a frequent supporter looking to deepen your involvement, I'd love to welcome you on board as a Truth Ambassador. Our Truth Ambassadors are faithful monthly givers who genuinely and generously support our gospel work and receive exclusive resources and communications directly from me. If you're interested in joining us or going deeper, You can learn more and sign up by calling 888-644-8811 or by visiting us online at ktt.org. We'd be thrilled to have you on our team. Yes, we sure would. And as a token of our appreciation, we'll send you a copy of Biblical Antidotes to Life's Toxins by Glenn Cade Gunderson, Jr. And you'll also receive a special welcome package designed just for our Truth Ambassadors. Now, if it's your first time reaching out to know the truth, we also want to send you a free booklet from Pastor Philip that offers wisdom for walking out a spirit-filled life. It's titled, Resting in God's Will. Learn more at ktt.org. Well, I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us next time for more solid Bible teaching here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.